Hey guys, Rob from Georgia here with you, aka VHS82 apostrophe. Man, oh man, episode 40. Uh, episode 40 as we uh, head towards the uh, the final, after this, the final eight. Uh, and we'll be done. And then coming up is a uh, two-parter. We may just handle that as one uh, one episode and then uh, move on into the last few. Uh, Space Warp, uh, directed by one Peter Medic. Uh, it airs December 2nd, uh, 1976. Uh, and uh, if you don't if you don't recognize Peter Medic's name, look no further than the ch changeling. Um, cat. This might be the first time uh, I ran into a director of one of these episodes who uh, directed what's considered uh, <clears throat> just an absolutely outstanding uh, ghost story. Uh, of course, George C. Scott, right? Um, just incredible, incredible. Unfortunately, <laughs> Unfortunately, um, yeah, uh, this episode is, um, it's not near as great as it could have been. Uh, it really suffers probably again, like most of these writing, uh, and I almost want to say Freiberger, um, uh, wrote this, um, and that maybe, but Peter Medic, I uh, learned about something about him, uh, I didn't realize he uh, directed Species 2 in 98. Uh, also an episode from, I think, the Masters of Horror, the Washingtonians um, in 07. But also he directed two episodes of uh, from Hannibal, uh, which is uh, really interesting. Which just gave me an interesting idea. I wonder about, uh, I wonder about if I can get my hands on that season, three seasons, I think, did it go? Um, yeah, maybe doing maybe doing a, a bit of this work with that, I wonder. Anyways, uh, so Peter Medic. Um, the other interesting little side note piece of trivia is uh, there's some uh, sound effects in this episode that were used by Rush in their video, Distant Early Warning. Uh, and I always find that pretty, I love freaking Rush, man. There's nothing like, you know, just when I'm on my cleaning craze in my house, I'll throw on uh, Rush and man, and psh, off I go. Uh, so what do we got in this episode, man? Space War. Really, uh, there are three three moving pieces here, really. Uh, you've got Moon Base Alpha sitting there, right? And they, uh, they realize there's this derelict craft, a spaceship, that's just sort of hanging out there in space near the third quadrant, something like that. And uh, so John and Alan, no, Tony, John and Tony to take Eagle One up to investigate. Well, as they're en route uh, to it, the second thing happens. Suddenly, Moon Base Alpha is catapulted uh, into a space warp and just basically left five light years off distance somewhere. Okay, so Moon Base Alpha is gone, leaving basically... Uh, John and uh, and Alan sort of just to drift without you know no really no way feasible way of getting back to Moon Base Alpha, not without entering into the same space warp. But then again, that is a trick onto itself. Uh, and so there's that. And then there's a third element here working, and that is with Maya, uh, as uh, John and Tony. Remember, Maya and Tony have this thing going on, right? Uh, you never explain, it's never really explained why this happens, but like coinciding with them taking off to go check out the derelict craft, uh, she descends into some sort of feverish, nightmare, sort of induced, I don't know, state. Um, and she starts having this, uh, into delirium, and she starts having these, uh, visions of uh Saikon, uh is going to be destroyed which i mean it's really sort of weird but this uh state of delirium um sort of catapults her into a state of not being able to control her ability to morph into whatever and so uh that is quickly coming unglued which becomes a little piece of chaos that Moon Base Alpha doesn't really need. And she's growing under the conviction uh, that she, uh, well, that one, that Psycon hasn't been destroyed yet, but it's going to be destroyed. And she has to steal an eagle and head out to Psycon, not realizing in her delirium that Psycon has already been destroyed. Um, 
never explained it all. Uh, so three moving pieces. The, the only piece that really was intriguing to me was this derelict craft. Um, very quickly, John and uh, Tony, I keep wanting to say Alan, John and Tony will realize that their only hope, if there is hope, is to dock up with this derelict craft and do some investigating and just see if there's anything there that can be of help. And of course, you know, it's a TV show, right? This has been written in such a way that um, what they find on the derelict craft is really a recording left from the previous commander whose crew was destroyed as a result of an explosion and accident. But they themselves were separated from their mothership as a result of the space warp. Um, and so they were left to adrift and there's an accident, the crew dies and the captain, only moments from dying himself, leaves a convenient log uh, for who, uh, whomever may suddenly, which, you know, Murr, Murr really kind of does a good job tearing this episode up. Um, I, I'll say this. I'll say this. Yeah, chances are someone's going to be more concerned with their own mortality. But if you got a captain, and depending on the race, and depending on just the, the overall context and situation, I mean, I, I can see where somebody might leave a warning behind that. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, if you happen to have been a victim or victimized by this base warp, uh, just know that we have locked in on the coordinates, but because of the accident, we are unable to do anything about it. We're all basically dead. Um, I've ejected everyone out into space as per uh, what we do with our dead, and I'm about to join them. But if there's anything useful in our databanks, have at it. And so, of course, the uh, convenience of a resolution laid out. And, of course, uh, Mer, or, uh, yeah, Mer, Mer does uh, point out one thing, and I'll point out even without his aid. Um, he doesn't point it out near enough. But then, you know, you're in this alien craft and you're looking at the computer banks and stuff. And, you know, you just got regular human numbers. Um, how is it that an alien species, how, how, no matter where we go in this universe that is Space 1999, it's just, there's too many conveniences in terms of um, yeah, being able to decipher and understand as a result of seeing your own your own formed numbers um, or language or you know whatever the, the the commander leaves a message of course it's in English you can understand what he's saying um, and so I don't know it just it just leaves a little bit to be desired but that component in of itself i thought there was a lot left to be desired there was a lot they could have done with it in fact they could have reshaped the entire episode and really spent most of the time instead of maya who descends into this metamorphing into like three different things she's psychotic and trying to uh steal an ego they're they're having to try to contain her at all costs without killing her um I really wish this episode would have been maybe the whole episode more much of it would have been centered on uh, John and, uh, and Tony at the derelict craft and maybe perhaps maybe because of, because Maya is uh, is an alien entity of her own kind um, because she's already has an emotional attachment to Tony is too much and in, 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 in to be separated and that would explain the delirium that she undergoes, maybe not even realizing it herself uh, that she was even capable of this would be a better explanation to no explanation. Um, and then, of course, you know, her metamorphing into three different things just gives uh, service to more action sequences, chasing and just the conflict, uh, which really the most ludicrous aspect is her ultimately ending up as a creature uh, outside in space on the moon. And of course, um, I think Helena and uh, I'll say Alan, maybe Alan go out there uh, in suits to try to uh, get her back in and end up fighting with her. Um, and I don't know. It's just I don't know. But I did I did really dig I, just the idea of a derelict craft uh, just sitting there floating there, victimized by this weird phenomena. Uh, there was a lot more I think they could have done with that. Um, but ultimately, everything is sort of tied up almost too neatly. 
uh, the resolution is found and they're able to, to it, take advantage of the space warp and uh, which Moon Base Alpha has also created a contingency where they have sent an eagle out as far as they could go, a refueling eagle that assuming John figured things out and got him back, they would be still too far to reach the moon by that point. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, there's some interesting things at play. Um, although I think the writing suffers and again, a lot of just familiar cliches from be it Star Trek episodes or whatnot. There was opportunity here, I think, to do something really absolutely kind of creepy. Uh, and it's too bad. I think they kind of missed it there. Uh, but interesting. Parts of it really, really interesting. At least when it concerns John and Tony in the derelict crap. It just, you know, that whole idea. Uh, so otherwise, uh, really, I mean, eh, not much to write home to Mama about on that one. Uh, there is a... Uh, a two-parter, as I said, coming up. The Bringers of Wonder, is that what it's called? The Bringers of Wonder, parts one and two. Uh, written by Terrence Feely and directed by Tom Clegg. Uh, it is... Uh, episodes 41 and 42 are, are treated together. So I'll do the same thing on the video. Uh, and treat it together on uh, the next one. So, Space Warp, what'd you think? If you see it, um, what did you think? Uh, um... What'd you think? Anyways, lost my whole train of thought. Let's leave it there. Not not bad, not the worst, uh, not the best either by any stretch. As always, as always, we leave these things off with Go Bills.